to the Princeton Advent Christian Church. The Lord has given us a beautiful day to come together to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We're glad that you're here, glad that we can worship him and experience his presence too. And I'm glad you're here to be part of honoring the Lord today. The Lord will be exalted all over the world and he can be exalted in your heart and in this congregation this morning. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. And then uh, the people, you can say, Look, Look he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierce stand, we're going to stand and sing Marvelous Message We Bring. Marvelous Message We Bring second coming of Jesus and for the gift of your Holy Spirit even now so that we are prepared and ready ready right now to continue as your witnesses and to praise you and to glorify you and to let others know of the joy and the peace that we experience as we praise your name may you be magnified this day and each day as we worship you in Jesus name amen you can be seated, and we're going to continue with, unless you have a Christmas in October offering, and then you don't have to be seated. And Matthew, don't hide back there. Matthew, I got a job for you. We already talked about this last week. So. Yeah, he knows, and you're here, and I'll give you the same instructions. 
You hold all the resources that people put in here, and you smile at everybody that comes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have our missionary offering at this time, but we're also going to sing, You Are My All in All in Praise to the Lord. Sing about our living hope in Christ Jesus. <laughs>
thankful that you're here and we can join together in reading the scriptures. The gospel reading comes to us from Matthew. We've uh, uh, looked at Matthew 26 and heading toward the end of it. Let's read together. Let's stand if you're able or want to and uh, proclaim God's word in 57 down through 68. 57 down through 68. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Worthy of death, they answered. And then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ. 
as I get the whole kind of thing, uh, created with a very simple kind of, uh, like a level, uh, 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 this attitude indicator, which is a horizon, where the pilots could then look to see how the wings, which were kind of represented by this line across there, matched the horizon of the Earth's surface. And then in the clouds, and in the fog, and in the storms, they wouldn't go upside down or tipsy to, unless they really wanted to. And, uh, and so this came out of the clouds, you know. So what is this all about then? It turns out that there needed to be a standard outside the pilot's own judgment for determining right and wrong in terms of flying, because when you're flying along as, you know, it's a pretty good clip there, you can't really trust your own head and sense of balance to get it right. Some of you can see right away that an outside standard is necessary then to know what the true kind of level is. Our own sense of it is not gonna be that true we might say. Same things applied in the first century that apply today. We, on our own, have a tendency to think we know what is true all the time, but we don't know ourselves that when we get our own kind of sense is not trustworthy, we don't have a comprehensive view of the ground because we're in the clouds or we're in a wrapped up in our own world, or we're sometimes in the fog of confusion, and we need an outside standard. Now, that, uh, in the uh, first century, Jesus is, uh, came into the world to give that kind of living truth. We might say, in one sense, that uh, he provides the standard of truth, but in a larger sense, really, since the Lord God was there before man was created, yes. since the Lord God was there before even the world was created, since in the beginning God was, we really have to see that truth itself was first understood as being part of the character of God. That it's organic with him, not an outside concept that is abstracted, like I can know the truth. So when Jesus came into the world, he revealed truth, and it was revealed inside himself, and it's personified in him. And sometimes we take these verses out of context, and we don't really understand that Jesus is talking to people in Jerusalem that were in conflict with him, that did not believe. Just as it's kind of 
would happen at his trial. And Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But Jesus wasn't talking about an abstract concept here. He was talking about, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so from the beginning, the Lord God was revealing himself and revealing the truth. And the only true measure is not ourselves of what is true, but an outside standard, and it's revealed to us by the Lord. Before even the world was created, the Lord God is the truth and always was the truth. It's just marvelous to think about that, but we want to get a little bit more toward our Matthew context to understand. But I wanted you to see some of this. So when Jesus comes on the scene and is uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw last week how the soldiers approached and they took him. Remember what time of day it was? It was night. And all of that has implications because who's in the dark, right? Soldiers and Judas and Everyone else. But Jesus is the light, and he's the way and the truth. And off they whisk him to the house of Caiaphas, as we read. And, and some might say an illegal assembly of the Sanhedrin was already in place. There were some high irregularities going on. First of all, a small group of the Sanhedrin was already assembled in the middle of the night. That was not the usual practice. And it wasn't the full group. Sanhedrin was a group of 70. 70, but they weren't all there. And they had already determined that Jesus was guilty. They just needed witnesses to try to get it kind of looking official-like. And they were meeting in a private house instead of uh, the, the high priest's house. So with all kinds of illegal irregularities going on. Why? Because they're flying upside down. They think they know everything in advance, and they're trusting in themselves rather than trusting in the outside source, which is Scripture revealing Christ Jesus. If they had just been open to it, things would have been different for these people. Now, in our text, we find out that they brought forth one witness after another, with all these false kind of charges going on. And Mark tells us they couldn't agree. They didn't agree. They each had different stories about all of this. But finally, there were these two that sort of agreed on something here. And they said, this fellow said in verse 61, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Now, you know what happens today. Uh, we, we call it fact-checking, right? Or they call it on the news. Yeah, you want to fact-check this. Let's fact-check this just a little bit and see. What did Jesus actually say? Well, John gave us the truth. Of course, John was there too. And this is what Jesus actually said. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But Jesus was not talking about a physical temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> he was talking about himself as the true temple. And Jesus did not say, I am able to destroy the temple, but he said that you Jewish people are going to destroy the temple. You're going to kill me. It's a prophecy of his own death. But I will raise it again. I will be raised up in three days. Prophecy of resurrection. Rebuild it in three days. So, again, we have people flying upside down in confusion and not even able to remember accurately his words. Isn't the world the same way today? Distortions truth. What is that? I hear it in my way, so it's, it's just 
my truth. I've got, I, I think this is the way we should go, right? Because, and into the fog we go. And into the perspective. But truth can be verified. And truth can be found in Jesus Christ. So in all of this, Jesus remains silent. And he doesn't have to say anything. And he sits, stands there, sits there, whatever it was, as a silent witness verifying the scriptures. How do I know that? Because the scriptures themselves prophesied that the Messiah would be silent. Let's look. Here is Jesus fulfilling the scriptures as a very witness that he is the true Messiah right in front of them while they are missing the truth and already have these preconceived ideas flying upside down into the darkness, even about scripture, and missing the whole true witness of Jesus. Isaiah 53, verse 7. Still today, many of our Jewish people are missing the witness, the true witness of Jesus. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Jesus, by not saying anything, was actually a more accurate witness that he is the true Messiah. And, and it's right there. But they were missing it. They had these preconceived ideas. He's guilty. We got to bring witnesses. We got to do away with him. They were more concerned with doing away with the truth, the living truth, Jesus, than they were in discovering and applying it to their hearts. And so we have this dramatic scene where the high priest stands up before them all. And he puts Jesus under oath. Says right to him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? We want to know the truth. And Jesus basically says, you have said it. You have said it. You have said it. But in the first century, their understanding of what Messiah meant was quite different from our understanding. For the first century, people were looking for a conqueror to come, such as Judas Maccabeus had come and reestablished for a brief time uh, the Jewish uh, nation just a hundred or so years before. They were looking for an overthrow of Rome. They were looking for an army general to kind of wipe out the Romans and set up an earthly kingdom that would expand and bring in Jewish prosperity all over and Jew uh, the Israel would take over a number one nation in the world. They did not understand that the Messiah would actually be the Son of God, Son of Man. They did not understand that the Son of Man would come to suffer and to give his life as a ransom in the first coming. He would lay down his life for the sins of the world. They did not understand. They had preconceived ideas. They were flying upside down again. And Jesus had to set the record straight. And he did that, how? Again, by scripture. And these verses that Jesus say are, uh, are put together from two sources, from David and from Daniel. And so we have Jesus, again, being a true witness. But I tell you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. Comes right out of Psalm 110, verse 1. You get that? David could see clearly. A thousand years before, the Lord said to my Lord, Yeah, sit here until I put all your enemies under your feet. I think I put it up here. Yeah. <laughs> until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord, the Almighty One, says to my Lord, David has a Lord. It's Lord Jesus. Sit at my right hand. And Jesus went on again to uh, quote from Daniel chapter 7. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. 
So while the, uh, the Jews had this upside down idea of a Messiah, Jesus points them to an exalted but suffering Son of God, Son of Man, who comes to give his life, an upside down view of their idea, one that suffers and then is exalted and is coming again. Then, at the end of the age, as Jesus says, in the future, you will see the Son of Man coming uh, with power and great glory. So, rather than an immediate victory, we have faith right now for all of God's people. An upside down view of the victory. But it's the truth. And Jesus is a true witness. He is accurate for us today as well as for them and in the first century. He's true in every way. You will see the Son of Man. It's just amazing. It isn't, you know, he's speaking this to the chief priests and to those condemning him. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is not a secret. This is not a snatching away of part of people. Every eye will see him. Every eye. You will, he says to his captors and those that are putting him uh, uh, or trying to deliver him over to Pilate. You will see the Son of Man. This is not a, a hidden thing. Christ is coming visibly, publicly, in glory, and the end of time is near. So we got to get ready. we got to get people ready. Complacent. As in the days of Noah, complacent. And Jesus, under oath, said, yeah, it's like you say, I'm Messiah, but let me explain, let me explain just a little bit more from Scripture. Jesus was a true witness. You will see the Son of Man. I am going to be exalted. I am going to be lifted up, not just to the cross, but to the heavens. I'm coming back in power and great glory. The witness is there. So what happens for us? <laughs> we will see the Son of Man. Here is Jesus under oath, under trial, suffering all night in prayer and struggling with all that is being laid upon him, the sin of the world. He's thinking about you. <laughs> you will see the Son of Man. Here is hope in the midst of everything that's going on. Jesus gives us hope. He wasn't carted off uh, involuntarily. He gave himself for you. And it's not just a hope of the future, although it is that, but you get to see Jesus. You get to see Jesus at work right now, not physically, but in the body of Christ. You have hope. Here is this great word of hope. Hope, true hope. And it's not just a wishful thinking, it is true. And it's all laid out for us in the Bible, the scriptures, the word of God. We as believers trust in an outside authority. We have to trust that our own perception of reality might not have it all together. It, we might be flying a little bit upside down without God to tell us and reveal to us the true way of salvation. Without God, there is no salvation. We can't do it on our own. So let us trust in the Lord. Let's trust in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Let us have Jesus set us free from our own captivity and our own depth perception our own misery and own perspectives. Let him open your eyes to the truth and see all oh, the hope that we have here even in the persecution. Jesus is Son of God, Son of Man, and he's coming again. You can have hope. And he wants you to see the truth. He wants you to look at him. Let's bow in prayer. Lord in heaven, Thank you for revealing truth to us. Thank you for revealing who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself, not just being content to 
Let us fly upside down through clouds until we crash. Oh, Lord God, thank you for the majesty and the glory and the power revealed in Christ Jesus. The truth that is there, and we long for people to take hold of that truth. We long for people to have the perspective that comes independently of our own opinion on things. So, help us also to be people of truth and love. Putting these things together just as, in, as you did, Lord Jesus, grace and truth together. Help us to be balanced in this respect. So while we have strong convictions, we're also very strong in our love. And while we have great love for people, help us to be strong in your word that we're not led astray to sentimentality or to a kind of complacency or just getting along. Help us to love so much that we're willing to say the truth. Thank you for loving us so much that you suffered for us. Wanted us, wanted us to have your grace and for all who believe to experience that salvation. And now we turn to you in resolution, Lord, and we ask that you would help us take a firm stand on these things, on your word, on your promises, and, uh, and really take on the challenge of loving, loving the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. You may want to sing with us. My hope is built on nothing less. to search out God's word, but we saw so many people not doing it. And we have that temptation today. Seek out other things, try to discover the truth and all everywhere, everywhere else but in God's word. But you can have the living word of God. You don't have to guess. You can have the solid rock in Jesus Christ. Amen. And then, you can stand on the promises, stand on the truth.
Jesus is the truth. Receive the good word, believe it, and live it out in Jesus' name. Let's sing. Standing on the promises of Christ, what a king. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God.